you can call meeting to order and can I welcome you to this, the ninth meeting of the Public Petitions Committee in 2018. Can I remind members and others in the room to switch phones and other devices to silent. The first item on our agenda is a declaration of interests in accordance with the terms of the interests of members of the Scottish Parliament Act 2006. May I invite Rachel Hamilton to declare any interest relevant to the remit of the committee. Thank you, convener. Um, I have no interest to declare. Thank you very much, and um, we welcome you to the, to the committee. The second item on the agenda is the consideration of new petitions. The first petition for consideration is Petition 1682 by James Jameson on access to specialist support for hydronitis superativa HS sufferers in Scotland. The note prepared by the clerk and Spice provides some background to the condition and explains that there is no cure. It explains the treatments that are typically available and used to treat the condition and refers to the specialist clinic at Guy's and St Thomas's NHS Foundation Trust in London. The briefing provides some information on research and guidelines and notes that there is no published sign guideline on the condition. The briefing also includes a note of an informal meeting that Rona Mackay and I had with the petitioner in April. Members may also have recently received a copy of a paper by Abvi with the findings of a survey recently conducted with HS sufferers in Scotland with the purpose of understanding the impact of living with HS for an individual in terms of not just their health, but the wider impact on their day-to-day -day living. And I wonder if members have any comments. I don't maybe if you want to say something, Rona, about our meeting? Yes. Um, we had a, an interesting meeting, um, and Mr Jameson explained the... Um, you know, the, the severity and, and, and the extent of, of how this condition affected his day-to-day -day life. And it was basically about lack of public awareness um, and the fact that there wasn't, he didn't feel there was enough um, specialist knowledge north of the border, basically. Um, so, yes, I mean, I think that's the nub of it, would you say? That's and one of the things that struck me was he had been supportive of other people who suffered. He said a lot of people didn't want to talk about their condition. They felt quite isolated by it. And when they did go for help, perhaps treated with less sympathy than they might have been entitled to because the people who were dealing with them weren't sufficiently specialist in understanding what the condition itself was. So I think his sense of people needed to know more about it, but also that there might be a way of kind of bringing together people of expertise when I think it was a specific clinic, the idea you would go to one place where people would be aware. Um, he gave some examples of people being treated quite dismissively, you know, the problem was they're overweight or you smoke too much when in fact this condition was, was chronic. Um, so I, I did think that we had never heard of the condition, so that in itself was, yeah, you know, I think we felt that quite strongly. Yeah, this uh -huh. was something that yeah. we had no awareness of yeah. and we were, I think we were both quite taken. Yeah. just how yeah. much it had had a massive impact in his life. And he described the experience of other people, both just in their, their family life, in their community life, but also their in, uh, affecting their ability to work. But when they were looking for help, feeling that, that yeah. folk weren't sufficiently alive to what were their experience. Yeah. I think he himself had started up a sort of support group for fellow <coughs> patients, which um, was difficult at times when he wasn't you know, well. But... Um, so he was just really keen to get some structure and, and some some support for this condition. Yeah. Ryan? I, think, um, I was really struck with the fact that, again, there's no guidance, from the same guidance here. And I think and it seems to be a recurring theme in some of the stuff that we do around um, the medical profession themselves and their understanding of, of certain conditions. So and I think this is one of, one of those as well. And, and almost brings me to, 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 to the conclusion that, that um, we might have to ask our educators mm -hmm. um, are, are, are around some of these, these conditions around, you know, are, are we, are we you know, informing our medical, uh, our medical staff are, are around these, uh, these conditions. So I mean, that, that, that struck me uh, as something that uh, if there's no sign guidelines, how on earth mm -hmm. do we treat? Mm -hmm. uh, we're, supposed to, we're supposed to ask our GPs to, to um, post, sign post them to take treatment. Mm -hmm. Rachel? Convener, can I just get some clarification on the um, referrals that can be made that is noted in the papers um, to guys in St Thomas's, but then it also says that the uh, health board would um, prefer that the treatment was delivered locally. Um, and I just wondered, is that currently available 
and is currently happening that there are referrals from um, NHS boards in Scotland to St Guy's. Well, I think his direct experience was that he he so managed. I, I think he 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 got a referral, but you then have the whole issue about. Tra I think he he was quite positive of his experience, yeah. but I think he found the whole um, yeah. the amount of time and effort it took to go down and so on was was yeah. quite exhausting. So he he his real argument was there should be a specialist clinic available to people so that that whoever you were dealing with understood exactly how the condition kind of revealed itself and how you lived with it. Um, but he, I suppose the question that I would be interested in asking with the health professional is, it, is it is it possible to run such a highly specialist clinic? Is there, is there enough mm -hmm. people? Or how would they then deal with that? Because mm -hmm. it's one of these things, if you've got a condition that very few people have, does that mean that you then don't have mm -hmm. the level of support that you actually require because there's not enough of you, which in itself is pretty... Mm -hmm. um, Horrific, but he certainly spoke very positively about his experience in London. But he felt he probably wasn't going to Indeed, continue that. And to the point where you know he was saying that when they att when attended that clinic, they got a card with a dedicated contact point for support for flare -up, emergency flare-ups. So he felt there was someone on hand mm -hmm. all the time if they called this number. But he, you know, we don't have that up here. So I think that's what he um, he wants to see. So in terms of taking it forward, I do think that. I think Ron and I both found um, Mr Jimison's discussion with us quite compelling and quite yeah, challenging, and, and you was. could see that there were, you know, there, there were clear things there that you would you would want to at least ask questions about. Um, so, I mean, certainly we'd want to write the Scottish government. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anything else? Um, we could write to the British Association of Dermatologists. Yeah. And the Hydra. Hydrodentist Super Vita Trust, um, just to, to, to seek their, their views. Um, yeah. Who would we be asking about this question about the sign guidelines? Um, yeah. well, could we start with the Scottish Government? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if we asked the Scottish Government, we could establish, would it be under like, Health Care Improvement Scotland? Or would they be, I don't know who instigates forgive my ignorance, I don't know who instigates them. Um, the need for guidelines or what prompts it. Yes, <laughs> I'll actually um, our equivalent up here if you like, um, in terms of, of, of a sort of conduit, and they would probably be able to, okay. to take that into sign. So I think, the, um, I think that would be very useful, and once we have that evidence we can then reflect on what we want to do further, and of course Mr Jimison would be able to give us a further comment if he, he wanted to do so. So I think we'd want to thank him for um, bringing the, the petition to attention and we look forward to getting more information from those that we're writing to. Rachel? Thank you. Can I just add that, um, get clarification on whether the health boards, um, uh, we have information about what the health boards currently offer other than just general dermatology services. Is there anywhere in Scotland that um, offers this kind of service at all or specialist um, treatment? Mm, I think Shall we start with the Scottish Government and yep. they would be able to ask them that question and they would obviously perhaps get the information from the health boards themselves and we can see what comes um, after that. Okay, um, if we can then move on to the next petition for consideration which is petition 1688 by Alistair Ewan on behalf of Westerton Gardens Sub Suburb Residents Association on Permitted Development Rights in Conservation Areas. The petition calls on the Scottish Government to review current legislation <coughs> on permitted development rights, which the petitioners consider impact unfairly on residents of conservation areas and listed buildings in Scotland. The background information to the petition refers to dilemmas that residents face, principally because of the technicality of being required to submit a planning application for minor work on a property. The note by the clerk and spies provides some background in the current requirements and refers to the Scottish Government's consultation on raising planning fees. It notes that Section 21 of the Planning Scotland Bill would allow ministers to make regulations allowing planning authorities to reduce or waive, waive fees in certain circumstances. The Local Government and Communities Committee published its Stage 1 report on the bill last week. The Scottish Government's response is expected before the summer recess. And I wonder if members have any comments. Bruna. Thank you, Convener. Um, yes, I would uh, say that this is a constituent of mine, and this um, suburb is based in, in my constituency. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the petitioner, you know, flags up the point. It's, it's not, it's not mentioned um, here. Um, he, he feels that the space briefing may, maybe doesn't quite address the issues that they face, and he, he cites the example of um, if he wanted to change the gravel in his drive, he has to he has to apply for planning permission or put up a very small new gate or something like that. And he's you know, it's something really tiny. They have to pay several hundred pounds for planning at the moment. Um, so, so it that in other communities, these would be deemed under. Um, Permitted development, but yeah, in a, in a conservation area, it's not. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, and and this is new to me. I didn't I didn't know that until this petition was brought. But um, I mean, as you say, it, it, you know, it, it's it's possible that this could be um, addressed in the, the new bill. Um, but I think we should I think we should write to the government just to, to see where we are with it, see what response we have in, in the meantime to that. Okay. Did, did, had had you, the petitioner a view on how you would protect the conservation area against people perhaps abusing mm -hmm. permitted development? I, I don't believe so. Um, the area is is quite distinct looking to, to be honest, and you know. It, it, I can't imagine anyone abusing it, really, to be quite honest. And I think he just objects to the minor um, things that they wanted to do to the house, um, you know, having to pay extra for oh, it. So, so, and time, presumably, yes, to go through the yes, process? Yes, yeah, yeah, the, the, having to go through the process. Um. OK, so Rona was suggesting that we write to the Scottish Government for its view and the action. Mm -hmm. I wonder whether um, there would be a view, view from the COSLA, the local authorities, around... Because presumably this adds a bit of pressure on planning departments, which are already mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. much under pressure. Yeah, it will do. Yeah. 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 Um, convener, I've certainly got um, some sympathy with the petition, but I can see the arguments on both sides. You, you know where do you where do you draw the line? But there's certainly, um, I would say, an argument to waive or, or reduce fees for minor work in these in these conservation areas, um, and it's it's, it's it's something that. The government and uh, local authorities should should be looking at. Mm -hmm. I'm just suggesting yeah, that perhaps we should ask in planning authorities, and that mm -hmm. would include capture those that are not managed by local authorities. Rachel, um, I noted as well that it c it includes listed buildings in Scotland as well as the conservation areas. There is a balance to be had between um, preserving um, listed buildings. Um, <laughs> and respect in conservation areas. However, there's also uh, a need, if necessary, to uh, actually maintain those, that, you know, and these residents are obviously keen to maintain yeah. mm -hmm. uh, their properties uh, on a regular basis and, and clearly have a pride in doing so, but this is holding them back. So it's a balance between That's achieving true. the, um, you know, the, the respect of the conservation of listed buildings, however, um, maintaining it on a regular basis. Yeah. Right. So the, the, the tension for me seems to be around um, gaining permission and the cost of gaining permission. Mm -hmm. there's, certainly, there's certainly something I think can be done quite uh, uh, around that area. I mean, as I say, we, we obviously have got to maintain, look after listed buildings, but if it's minor alterations, surely we could do mm -hmm. something around the cost of yeah. that. For sure. Well, uh, that makes perfect sense, except that planning, planning departments very often are very, have been very reduced. And the, the, I think the argument always been that it should be self-financing um, in planning mm -hmm. terms. So, but, you know, I can, I can, it does feel onerous for for individuals within a community having to live within a conservation area. So it would be interesting to know how that that could be addressed. Mm -hmm. So is that agreed then? Sorry, yes. Angus. Yes. I, I was just going to point out, convener, um, in our papers it states that section 21 of the new Planning Scotland Bill. Um, which is, as we know, has just passed stage one, um, would allow ministers to make regulations allowing planning authorities to reduce or waive fees in certain circumstances. So it has been considered in the, the new planning bill. So it means that local authorities to take the decision. Okay, um, I think there's a, a number of things we want to do with that. I think it's raised some interesting issues. If we can then move on to the third agenda item, which is the consideration of continued petitions. The next petition for consideration is Petition 1548 by Beth Morrison on national guidance on restraint and seclusion in schools. At our last consideration of this petition in March, we agreed to write to the Deputy First Minister 
inviting him to respond to the petitioner's feedback on the approach set out in Included, Engaged and Involved Part 2, referred to as IE 1-2. The Deputy First Minister states that he considers that approach to be the correct one, but repeats his commitment to the committee that if it is found that the guidance is not effective, he will re report back to the committee and consider whether it would require to be put on more of a statutory footing. He sets out a range of measures that are in place to form an evidence base on which he can report back to the committee in April 2019. The petitioner welcomes the Deputy First Minister's continued support and commitment to report back to the committee, but repeats her concerns that, anecdotally and based on responses to freedom of information requests, restraint is still being used daily. The petitioner welcomes the Children Commissioner's formal investigation on this issue. Members will recall that the petition, petitioner has also previously contrasted the IEI2 guidance to the draft guidance that was being consulted on in England. Through correspondence between officials, the UK government has indicated that its consultation closed in January. Responses have been analysed and the report is expected to be published soon. I wonder if members have any comments on what action we might take. Brian? I guess the, 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 um, what strikes me is around you know, the idea that it, you know, the, first, the Deputy First Minister is saying the, guide, the, the guidance is not effective, I suppose. That really comes down to how you're gathering evidence and how you're mm -hmm. reporting on that evidence mm -hmm. to whether or not that's, that's effective. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we've heard this quite a lot of evidence around this one. So, for me, I think that um, I'm, I'm interested to see, you know, when, when the UK government's consultation paper comes out, um, we can maybe ask them uh, when that's due, because yep. uh, that will inform quite a lot of uh, what we we'll yeah. do next on this. So we can contact the UK government on its consultation and how it's going to develop its draft guidance. And I suppose the question for John Swinney is, how is he going to establish if it's not been yeah. effective? Because we would be concerned. My sense is the petition is very positive about her experience in contact with government and with John Swinney in particular. But she's saying, but the reality over here is daily. That's the it's not been implemented. Yeah. Two things are not mm -hmm. being brought together. Yeah. So um, I wonder if we could maybe agree to write to... to the, the, the cabinet session just ask how they would intend um, ensuring or establishing whether it's effective or not. What what are they going yeah. to do in order to make that happen? And we can write to the UK government. Yeah. Okay. Is that so agreed? Agreed. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, if we can now move to the next petition for consideration, which is petition one five seven seven by Rachel Wallace on adult cerebral palsy services. At the last consideration of this petition in March, we discussed what further action we wished to take. This included deferring the petition until the findings of the consultation in the National Action Plan on neurological conditions are published, or closing the petition and inviting the petitioner to submit a new petition in a year's time if they remain dissatisfied with the conclusions of the Action Plan. The committee agreed to ask the petitioner what her preference would be, and she has stated that she wishes the, the petition to be deferred until the outcome of the Scottish Government's projects in relation to neuro neurological healthcare services is, n are known, is known. She goes on to express concern that if the petition were closed, momentum would be lost on the issues raised in her petition. And I wonder if people have a view on what we should do. Rona? I think we should respect the petitioner's um, wishes to defer it, um, you know, for, for the reasons that you've really just, just read out. Um, so it's, it's such an important issue. I think it, it, it wouldn't wouldn't be the right idea to close it and then for her to have to bring it back. So I would I would prefer we deferred it. That agreed. Oh, great. Yeah, and I think I, I remember at our last consideration of this, we were very keen that that you know there was arguments in both cases and it felt right just that we would take the petitioner's view on it and that allows us to um, ensure that we can re return to this issue once the. Uh, the findings of the Consultation and National Action Plan on Neurological Conditions are published. So is that agreed? And we can thank the petitioner again for um, responding to our request for advice from her. OK, we can now move on to the next petition for consideration, which is Petition 1596 by Paul Anderson, James McDermott and Chris Daly on in-care survivor service Scotland. When we last considered this petition in March, we agreed to seek the views of members of the cross-party group on adult survivors of childhood sexual abuse. We have since re received submissions from Health in Mind and Wellbeing Scotland. The Clark's note summarises the differing views within the submissions. It notes that Health in Mind is part of the Futures Pathways Alliance, 
which is tasked with oversight of the operation of future pathways. Health in Mind sees future pathways as a gateway to a wide range of flexible, person-centred support and services which complement the more limited choices available through conventional funding. It states that cognitive behavioural therapy treatments used by any NHS providers follows a biosocial model, not a medical model. Wellbeing Scotland, which was formerly Open Secret, provides the in-care survivor service Scotland. While it acknowledges the additional support offered by Future Pathways, it is concerned that it is in a subservient power dynamic with Future Pathways. Wellbeing Scotland adds that it considers that the model of support, whether that is bio, psycho, social or medical, has caused further confusion and concern. It suggests that many survivors do not identify with mental health services and adds that anxiety has increased among some survivors as they feel that Future Pathways is working towards a model of time-limited support and the promise of lifelong support has been withdrawn. Can I add that um, I actually met with Future Pathways and I met with the petitioner and Wellbeing Scotland and I should declare an interest as a member of the cross-party group um, on adult survivors of child sexual abuse. And what struck me, I had a very productive meeting with the Future Pathways um, group and I was interested to see how that worked. There was an issue about a, a backlog. There's something like an eight, nine, nine month waiting list and I'm not quite sure. I think the issue is if you're not registered with Future Pathways, you can't then access the services. So you're waiting. And even if the service you want to access is um, the Wellbeing Open Secret Service, you can't access it if you've not registered. So that was one concern. But when I met with the petitioner, one of the petitioners, and with Wellbeing, the questions they were really raising were something around the process of future pathways. For example, um, th th there seemed to be a suggestion that you would have to have a, um, a meeting with uh, or a consultation with a clinical psychologist. Now, a lot of survivors don't want to do that because of their experience. I don't want to be in a position where they have a clinical diagnosis of something that has happened to them because that has an impact on their lives. And there was a fear that people might um, not therefore go to future pathways because of that. They're also concerned whether the group work model, individual counselling over a longer period of time would also be available and this sense that, um, that things shouldn't be time limited. Now, to be fair, when I met with future pathways, they did say that it didn't have to be Time limited. What struck me about it, and we also had a conversation, a meeting, we discussed it briefly in the cross party group, and it wouldn't have been possible to come to one view on it. Um, but there is no doubt that people want to make sure that people get this, the, the support that they require. And the argument really is about whether organisations should be given a certain amount of money, as other support services like Women's Aid will be given, they get core monies and they're accountable for how they spend it. Or do you give people it, the money by the people that they treat? And I certainly know that some of the folk, including um, Anne MacDonald, who was the initial petitioner to this committee on a strategy um, for survivors, feels that that brokerage model is not the right one for people who've had that trauma. So I, what I struck me about it was it's actually a very interesting issue. And it's not so much now about this very specific thing that brought the petition forward round what was happening with this um, particular funding of Open Secret, but it is actually about are we doing the right thing in terms of how we support people, given, I think, the very pivotal role of this committee, actually, way back in the day in getting the, Scot the, the government, the executive, as it was at that time, to produce a, a, a strategy. So I wondered, and I'm interested if people th thought, whether it would be useful to get an opportunity to get some evidence this is such a live issue because of the inquiry and because of adults speaking out. We need to make sure, I think, that, we're, that the sports are there for them. I think we would all agree with that. Um, and I think the Scottish Government agrees with that. And whether the models that are being developed are the ones that people feel most comfortable with. Angus? Yes, thanks, um, Convener. There is, of course, the added issue that Wellbeing Scotland have highlighted that... Um, Given the, the nine-month waiting list that you mentioned uh, and the requirement that um, survivors have to be registered within three months, then there's, there's clearly a, a disparity there and a funding issue for Wellbeing Scotland if they're going through the, mm -hmm. the brokerage system. But the, the submission from, from Wellbeing Scotland certainly makes a, 
uh, for interesting reading. And at, at first glance, to to someone looking in, it would seem that the broker type model is working. However, from from Wellbeing Scotland's point of view, uh, it's not working to the extent that Future Pathways claim. Uh, and perhaps I should uh, declare that uh, I have had dealings with uh, Open Secret mm -hmm. um, before they became Wellbeing Scotland. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I, I'm fully aware of, of the issues that uh, that they've been facing. Um, uh, of particular concern to me uh, is the statement from Wellbeing Scotland that the promised lifelong support isn't there. Um, that was I remember that being promised way back at the start when when the new model was being being looked at, and it's uh, extremely concerning if if um, if that's uh, you know, if they've gone back on that. So um, I think there is a strong argument to to ask them to come in and give us some evidence face to face so that we can get to the bottom of this because it's clearly, um, it needs to be addressed once and for all. It's been dragging on far too long. Yeah. Yeah. Rona? I think exactly as you said, I think it's, we're now looking at whether the model and the framework is correct and it's such a big issue we do need to hear from, you know, the, directly from the organisation. I mean, it would be fair to say the Scottish Government has put quite significant funding into future pathways. Mm -hmm. The extent to which that is then channeled out into mm -hmm. actual support is something that's in itself yeah. it's interesting and, I, and I, you know that I suppose the analogy I drew when I was meeting with wellbeing you wouldn't you know run an accident emergency department on the basis of how many le broken legs had come yes. in yeah. and then you get funded for every broken leg yeah. you deliver the service and you provide yeah. the service and if nobody with a broken mm -hmm. leg comes in mm -hmm. then so be it and I think yeah. I would be concerned that um and I'm interested in the argument round why it's done that different way. Certainly, mm -hmm. as I said, Anne McDonald, who was the original petitioner, did say to me that it, she didn't feel it was in line with that original view of how you actually support people, but mm -hmm. it would be worthwhile. I wouldn't say that the cross-party group in itself wouldn't have taken a completely unified view on that, and I wouldn't want to represent it in that way. Mm -hmm. Brian? And okay. part of whether we go into, into to this kind of detail, but for me, the I think the uh, sort of the men men mental health is taking sort of much more of a prominent um, uh, role within this this parliament. Certainly, the, 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 the short time that I've been in here, and I'm very interested to see how this this approach, how that fits into a, to, to a, a, a mental health strategy and an mm -hmm. approach. Because I think I think that's still an evolving uh, evolving strategy, and mm -hmm. uh, I, I would be keen to hear, as you said, hear, hear some evidence and see how that aligns itself with the current strategy. I mean, certainly that um, the, the desire is to have a trauma-informed approach. So, you know, very often survivors will say, well, actually, I'm OK. What's caused my problem is the trauma I've gone through. Mm -hmm. So, you know, but to that's just the argument about whether it's a medical model or a social yeah. model. So, um, I mean, I think, as it has been suggested, I think it's agreed, we would look to a session with um, Future Pathways perhaps Wellbeing Scotland and a petitioner if they felt they were able to do so um, to come to us. That would afford them the opportunity to yeah. hear that evidence and then respond to us and it maybe we'd want a further session at that stage. And it would be also be fair to say one of the things that did come back um, was a sense of survivors generally that the, you know much of the abuse that people experience would have been in their own home and their own community rather than in care. Um, and I suppose that, that broader question of how we support people of Live by that trauma yes. is important. But if we were then agreed that we would um, give the clerk's authority to work out how best to run those two sessions. Okay, if that's agreed, and we can thank um, all of those who've responded, and I'd want to thank particularly the petitioner for Paul Anderson for meeting with me. Um, we can now move on to the next petition for consideration, which is petition 1645 by James Ward on the review of legal aid in Scotland. Um, at our previous consideration of this petition in March, we agreed to write to the Scottish Government inviting to set out how it would respond to the recommendations of the Independent Strategic Review of Legal Aid, which was published on 28th February. In its response received on 11th April, the Scottish Government indicates that it is giving serious consideration to the recommendations and that the Minister for Community Safety and Legal Affairs will be meeting with key stakeholders in light of these recommendations. And I wonder if members have any comments. Angus? I think, convener, um, given, given that um, meetings uh, have 
uh, and are still to be held. We should write to the Minister for uh, Community Safety and Legal Affairs uh, to seek an update on our meetings with the stakeholders, including um, which included uh, the Law Society of Scotland, the Faculty of Advocates and the Scottish Legal Aid Board. Okay. Position here where we would take evidence. Sorry? Are we, are we far enough down the line here where we would potentially take evidence from any of these bodies? My sense is that, that this is something that government is wrestling with with stakeholders and it's really, you know, yeah. as long as we can't have an inquiry in a parallel unit, so once, yeah. once we know what they're doing, it would maybe be worthwhile, thing. you know, so if we can get an update, then that would afford the petitioner an opportunity to provide maybe a further written okay. submission. Yeah. If that's agreed. Yes, okay, thank you. If we can then move on to the next petition for consideration, which is petition 1668 by Anne Glenny on improving literacy standards in schools through research informed reading instruction. Since our last consideration of this petition, we have received submissions from the Deputy First Minister, Dr. Sarah McGowan, and the petitioner. There are points of agreement within the submissions. For example, an acknowledgement of the evidence base to support the use of systematic synthetic phonics as part of a broader package of early reading instruction, and that there are some gaps in the knowledge and understanding of some teachers, both new and existing, of the latest and high, highest quality research in early reading instruction. The petitioner and Dr Sarah McKeown do, however, express concerns about the teaching and learning toolkit and about the efficacy of the self-evaluation framework referred to by the Deputy First Minister. The petitioner identifies concerns about the ability of initial teacher education departments to evaluate their own work and queries whether the self-evaluation framework working group includes, quote, specifically someone knowledgeable in current reading research and best practices for reading instruction. And I wonder if members have um, comments on how to take this forward. Rona? I think really we have to... Um await the publication of, of framework which is the draft should be available next month um, and that's from that I think then we could maybe move forward and uh, depending on what that contains and whether it seeks the whether it addresses the concerns um, raised in the petition um, that would be that would be my um, recommendation at the moment I was quite struck by the fact that they were closer to to each other than perhaps had initially been yeah. suggested that too, this idea yeah. that you either did this or you didn't do I, it I thought that um, or that it was useful or it wasn't useful I thought it was it was useful in a broader context so the question then really is about mm. the extent to which it's part of um, teachers uh, personal professional development mm -hmm. so we would be agreeing um, to wait the publication of framework then get the petitioner's view and whether it addressed their concerns. Um, and I wonder, and we would also be asking the Deputy First Minister to respond to concerns expressed about um, the terms of the membership of the working group and to try and get a timetable for the publication of the draft framework, if that's agreed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, before we move into private session, can I just say, um, in conclusion, first of all, to we welcome Rachel and to thank Michelle Ballantyne for the work she did with us, but also to note that sadly, Catherine Ferguson, the clerk, who's been a clerk to the committee for the last three years, is moving on and probably up. Um, I just want to personally thank her for all the support she's given me since I became um, convener of the committee. She is um, a brilliant professional, very organised, and I also know very good at what I think a challenge for all our clerking team, that is you're dealing with petitioners who have got... Um, issues that matter deeply to them and very often sensitive, very personal issues. And I know that you all uh, play a really important role in being as welcoming and as considerate and thoughtful to those petitions as they can possibly can be. So I want to thank you all, but I know that, that uh, Catherine has led by example in that. So I want to thank you very much and wish you all the very best. And you are allowed to come back with visiting <laughs> rights. <laughs> so thank you very much. And we can now close the formal part of the meeting. <laughs>